Try one more time. Woo! Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I'm so glad you are all here this morning. All your lovely faces. Good morning, Hezekiah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hello to you on Facebook. We're so glad that you're joining us. We have a full house. We have a combination service of Harvest Time South and Friendship Church. Woo! Represent! All right, so cool. So um, for those of you that don't know, we have a really fun relationship with our Friendship Church, and uh, we've been using their church for over a year, and now they've come today to use our church, and we are so excited to have this opportunity for you guys to see our church. And so if you would like to have tours or to uh, maybe you just got here and you didn't get a chance to look around, we would love to do that for you today so that you guys can see all of the nooks and crannies of our new building. And um, we also want to invite everybody to stay after service for a potluck. So uh, you're thinking, oh, no, Pastor Dan didn't tell us to bring anything. Well, that's all right, because we plan for you not to bring anything, and we have plenty of food for everybody. So, Pastor Dan, you didn't forget. It's okay. So, we're so happy that you're here. We have a few announcements. Um, if you attend Harvest Time South on a regular basis, so um, this isn't necessarily for our friendship people, uh, we need more help in our tech booth. And so, if you're like, hmm, I like computers and I'm computerly inclined or I like to make sound sound nice but I don't want to sing up front or play any instruments. Um, our tech booth is super cool. It's got a really interesting entrance and so you can feel like you're kind of part of this VIP team. And, uh, and it is located back there if you want to turn around. Look, Mercedes, you want to give a wave? She is in charge of our scheduling, and she would love to put you on the schedule. And we train people, and so you don't have to know anything. We will teach you everything. If you're like, oh, I thought that I couldn't be on this team because it seems so VIP, no, you can totally be on the team. We want you on the team. Um, we also need more uh, people to sign up to be children's helpers for our uh, our summer services and so we have a sign up area um, over by our drinking fountain we also have a sign up there for the broiler fest and for uh, the broiler fest we have a couple different sign ups we have one for the parade uh, if you would like to help make the float or even walk in the parade we're doing a really fun theme um, it is should I tell them the theme pastor okay we're going to do a harvest time hoedown how fun is that? So we're going to like have, you know, like cowboy boots and uh, jeans and plaid shirts and all this fun stuff. And, uh, and you can wear a cowboy hat, you know, and we're going to uh, play some Christian country music. And it's just going to be a blast for the kids, for the adults. We're not going to do the kitty parade. We're just doing it all in the big parade because it's a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to help with any of the decorating for that, uh, the sign-up sheet is over um, by the drinking fountain, along with we have to man our booth. And so we want people to sign up for the time that they're interested in covering the booth so that uh, maybe you have a friend that you want to do it with, and then you guys can sign up together. Um, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, like, maybe I'll ask Ellie, hey, Ellie, you want to sign up for the booth at the same time? And she'd be like, yeah, and then I can hang out with my friend for two hours. How cool is that? So find a friend, sign up for the booth. All right, we also have um, our Women of Faith. Um, that's our women's ministry. We're going to be doing a real, some really fun crafts on June 12th from 1 p.m., and so I would really encourage you, if you're a woman, um, whether you're from Friendship Church or our church, we don't care. We just want to hang out with, a bun with the ladies and have some time away. And so everybody is welcome to do that. All right. So if you could all stand up, we're going to greet each other and say hello.
bring friends. scary. I see where your mom, where she gets it from. Hello! Hello! Thank you. This is exciting, huh? All these nice folks. You guys should just stay here. You know, it's, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, I missed the first part of announcements. How much did Rachel welcome you and thank you, Friendship? Uh, let's do it some more. So, Friendship, are you all aware uh, that we would not probably have a functioning congregation or this building uh, without your love? I mean, when we left and we had no place to go, we could have maybe gone to one of the public areas in Mondovi but with, with COVID, as you know those things would have been shut down and that opportunity would have been shuttered. Um, it was by the grace of God and your guys' love and friendship that uh, we were able to weather that storm uh, and make it here. And so we are forever grateful uh, for that. We love you guys. I want to cry. Who wants a hug? <laughs> Who wants a love hug? I'm not giving you one. I was just teasing. Um, <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, this is exciting. I, I, and also, just, I don't, I didn't plan anything because I'm not much of a planner, but um, just this is something wildly different uh, that your church is exhibiting. Uh, the fact that you would close the doors of your church on a Sunday morning and go somewhere else, trust God with all of that, is, it shows a different heart. It shows what uh, Christian love and, and fellowship should really be. And so you guys are not just a blessing, but an inspiration uh, to us. So thank you for that. Um, I don't know what you told your people about their offerings, but if I get a check in my box that's from your people, I'm going to send it back to you because we don't want your money. Uh, <laughs> if, you make it out to harvest, if you make it out to harvest time, I don't recognize your name. I'm going to cut, you know, I'm going to cash it and then cut Pastor Dan a check. So <laughs> just so you know, that's what's going to happen. We will not receive any more blessings from you. We would like some treasures in heaven of our own. So that's what's happening. All right, we're going to begin our service. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, we do a call to worship, which is just a short scripture reading with a very brief uh, reflection as we begin. Uh, the call to worship this morning is from uh, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55. Um, I'm going to read verse 1 through 3 uh, and then verse 6. It says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live prophet tells the people, you're all hungry, you're all thirsty, and you all desire things, you need things, and he says you're going to find those things in Christ. You can pursue them with money, you can pursue them with your time, you can pursue them with your anxiety or with your, the strength of life, but the only place you're going to find that fulfillment, the nourishment, the joy that those things bring is in the Lord. And then in verse 6 he says, seek the Lord where he may be found, call upon him while he is near be found here. He is near here. And so I just encourage you as we worship and pray and begin that you would seek him for all, all that your heart is longing for. Amen.
to stand.
to pray um i just encourage you to pray that the words of those songs are real i think when you just sing it we're we're saying you know we want it to be still we don't want to fear we don't want to be anxious at all and really it's a song about the glory of god and his majesty if we would just believe that because i have christ that all the storms of life would be stilled that all the anxieties and fear would be done away with if we would just stand and believe on who our god is and so as we continue uh, to worship let's just pray i'm going to pray out loud but if you would pray uh, in your own words let that be a reality in our lives heavenly father we thank you that we don't have to do this on our own father that we don't have to stand against the trials of this life or against the fears or against the bitterness or against the sins we don't have to conquer it on our own strength thank you father that you do that for us in christ father and we do believe 
we do believe that you fight for us. We do believe that when you say, peace, be still, that we find peace in our hearts and peace in our circumstances, even in the midst of a storm. And so, Father, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that you love us. And we thank you that you speak peace over our lives. Father, we just pray that you are glorified in our worship. And I pray for your help as I endeavor to preach your word, God, that you would help me. Help me, Father. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nope, still awkward. I was trying to do a different transition. I couldn't muster it. Uh, going with the awkward. You might imagine that such an illustrious occasion with you know, the congregations gathered that I would have prepared something you know, special or different or remotely related to what we are celebrating, but I didn't. Um, we are continuing uh, just the series that we have been in. Uh, we welcome uh, you guys to just join along in that series. Uh, as a part of our seek first, our goal to seek first the kingdom of God, to not just be Christians in name only, but to pursue him and to seek him first and to reflect him to the world. And we are now in a series on forgiveness. Uh, last week we discovered lots of things that forgiveness isn't. Um, and we discovered that Christ uh, not only commands it, but we saw from the parable of the unforgiving servant that our doing it, doing the forgiving or not doing the forgiving, um, shows and reveals to the extent that we have been, that we have been forgiven. Um, and this morning we're going to discuss how unforgiveness not only is wrong, uh, but how unforgiveness is a trap. It's a trap of the enemy. Oh, hey buddies. Sorry, I just like my friends back there. What up guys? All right, sorry. Not so much we love our people. Uh, anyway, I just... <laughs> We're going we're gonna to begin uh, in the same place uh, as we began last week, and that's with the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 6, and I'll read verses 12 through, through 15. It says, Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one which is the end of the prayer, and then Jesus reiterates, verse 14, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Um, and we talked last week how it was significant that Jesus only reiterated uh, this matter of forgiveness after he taught them to pray for it in the Lord's Prayer. Um, I think it's also uh, significant that we are, we are taught to pray, Father, forgive us our sins, our debts, in the same way as we forgive. And then Jesus immediately follows that in the prayer with, uh, lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from the evil one. And I, I think it would be wildly liberal if I said that the only trap or the only temptation or the only deliverance uh, that, that Satan means to, or that Jesus means to uh, protect us from is this trap of unforgiveness. But I do think that it's significant in the wording that he tells us uh, pray for forgiveness, seek forgiveness, forgive others, don't fall into the trap of the enemy, and then he goes on and says uh, forgive and then you will be forgiven, forgive not and you will not be forgiven. I think there is a connection there and that is the connection that we're praying that we do not fall into this trap of unforgiveness. This is the snare, this is the trap that Satan uh, is, is setting for us. And that's sort of the angle that we're going to go on this morning. That failing uh, to exercise biblical forgiveness uh, is a trap of the enemy. Uh, it is a scheme to prevent us both from forgiving our brothers, but also uh, from being forgiven. That's where we're going. That was all intro to the intro. Cool? Uh, so I found a rather extreme example uh, in the church of Corinth. The example of, I don't know why I picked this, I have no idea. This is why I'm a terrible pastor. I didn't realize how many young people we would have or new people we would have, and I'm thinking, geez, I should have done something different. In any event, uh, the example I picked is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 and 2, uh, and it's in regards to a man who was caught in a bizarre uh, sexual sin 
uh, and how the church responded and how the apostle uh, taught him to respond. That's where we're going. I will read those verses. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who had been doing this? Been doing this. So this man is having a bizarre relationship uh, with his mother-in-law. He has sinned against his father. He has sinned against this woman. He has sinned against uh, the church, who is supposed to be reflecting uh, God's glory and his redemptive work. And, and obviously he has sinned against God. Uh, and the Corinthians, they were, they were proud. They were proud to have such a sin uh, in their midst. Uh, presumably their pride was not like in relation to the sin itself. Uh, presumably their pride was in their tolerance in their tolerance of that sin. Uh, and there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, that is the day that we live in, that, uh, that, we, that we believe that God's moral laws don't matter. We believe because uh, Jesus forgives that it doesn't matter uh, the way that, that we live, that grace abounds, and so we can just continue in it. And that's how the church was responding uh, in their sort of twisted forgiveness or whatever the case is. And Paul says, no, <laughs> no, that isn't the way you're supposed to respond. He actually says he should have kicked this fellow out of the fellowship. He refused to repent. Uh, he refused to change. And we talked about that last week, that forgiveness doesn't mean uh, condoning, and forgiveness doesn't mean celebrating. Right? It doesn't say you do you, uh, but it says that we speak the truth in love. And love has to be the motivation. Right? Love has to be the motivation. And you might be asking yourself, well, how does kicking somebody out of church, <laughs> how is that loving? Anyone have that question? Nope, just me? No, it's you. Okay, we're the only inquisitive ones, I guess. Weird. Uh, <laughs> how, is that, how is that loving, right? Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll find out how it's loving if you keep, if you keep reading, because uh, you'll, find, you'll find the answer in verse 5, because he says, so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. So that his spirit might be saved. Because the goal of, of that response to the sin was that, that he would be saved, that he would repent and then we'd come back to Jesus. And I think that as we're in this series of forgiveness, and we're sort of battling with this, I would imagine, uh, and you may be struggling with it from last week too, that there's these different things uh, that are hard to forgive, and should I forgive or can I forgive? Um, what is our motivation in keeping, the, in keeping the unforgiveness? Is it to get back at them? Is it to make them pay? Is it you know, some need for justice or some need uh, for vengeance? Or is the goal love? Is the goal that people would have salvation? Is the goal that people would find peace. And even though the, the tone of Paul's comments sound harsh, he's like, look, pagans don't even do this weird stuff. You know, he says, what are you doing? You should have mourned. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be proud, right? But the emotion to that isn't anger. It's harsh, but it isn't anger. The emotion the Apostle Paul is saying is he says, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning? Into mourning. That's the emotion behind Paul's response uh, to the sin, that there would be a brokenness over the sin. Not this a sorrow that you were hurt, but a sorrow over just the sin in general. That that, that, that brother who came to the church in Corinth, or the church, our church, or, or your church, or whoever you're picturing, uh, that that brother was so uh, deceived, that he was so broken in, in his heart and in his mind, uh, that he was able to justify uh, such a behavior, that he was able to justify such a sin, that he was sitting there week after week after week, hearing the word of God and being in the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, and in the fellowship of other believers, and yet he refused uh, to follow the Lord, and then he refused uh, to repent. And that should grieve us. It should grieve us. And so I think what Paul is first teaching us from this is that our response to sin should not be anger and bitterness, but it should be, it should be mourning. It should, that, it should be that we are grieved uh, for the sake of Christ and for the sake of that other person, uh, that, this, that this has happened. I think that's especially true in the church. You know, because we have, we have everything, you know. We have the Lord Jesus, and we have forgiveness, and we have the words of eternal life, and we have the spirit of the living God. We, we should be different. And so when we see these things, or we fall into these things, we shouldn't respond with anger, but with, with morning. How did this how did this happen? We are to be the light. We are to be the light that shines in the dark place. And we and we see in response to Paul's letter uh, that the church actually did repent and they did 
uh, go into mourning. And that was found in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 10 through 11. And I'll read it for you. It says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So we see that the church had repented, about 18 months have passed between letters, the church had repented uh, in the meantime of the error, uh, that they were now filled with, with godly grief uh, over what had happened, and that grief had produced repentance and longing and zeal and passion for the Lord and all these other things. They had escaped that trap, that first trap of Satan, that first trap that said uh, that we're just going to condone this, we're just going to condone this, rather than speaking the truth in love. Uh, they had escaped the trap that would have ruined their church, because that would ruin a witness. And I don't know how many times I speak to people that don't go to church, and they say, I'm gone, and some of this is just an excuse. Uh, but some of it's real. You know, I go there and they tell me that I should receive Jesus and I should flee from this sin or I should flee from that sin and I should be forgiven and set free. And they're doing the exact same, same things that I'm doing, right? That's the snare, that, that our forgiveness isn't real forgiveness, isn't real truth. Uh, it's just condoning uh, what we do. And so they overcame that first snare um, to just ignore it. And in 2 Corinthians, as we continue on, chapter 2, uh, verse 5 through 8, we see that they overcome another of this snare that is presented in the matter of forgiveness. It says, If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me. And he has grieved all of you to some extent, but to put it, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him, and then verse 11 it says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So, so Paul's <laughs> it's talking about this man. This man had grieved him, and now we're going to welcome him back. Uh, Paul's response, this whole thing, really reminds me of the prodigal son. Does anyone remember the prodigal son? You do? You want to tell me the story, Dan? Good, I didn't want you to. Whew, I was glad you said no. Uh, <laughs> Can't tell how long I'm going to talk to much, talk for much less how long you would. Uh, so the prodigal son, you may not know, you probably do, uh, left the father. Uh, he chose the world uh, and his pleasures. I took notes because I don't remember it either. Uh, took uh, <laughs> took the uh, the wealth of his father and he and he left. He chose the the pleasures of the world uh, over over his father. He made that choice. He made that choice. He said, "I care more about me. I care more about my life than I do about God." And so and so God did kick him out. Right, that son. The son left his father. And, and I think that's important to note. That's the same thing that happened with Paul. Paul wasn't kicking this guy out of the fellowship so much as this guy in his sin was choosing to leave the fellowship by what he was doing, right? That man had made a decision. He had chosen his sin. He would refused to repent. Uh, and so he was, he was removed. And I think we also note that the father in the story of the prodigal son did not go to the son in the pig pen. Okay? He was there, and he was hungry, and he was dirty, and he was desperate, and the father did not go to him, right? Just as Paul says, you know, don't condone this. You know, don't act like it, don't act like it's no big deal. And the reason for both of those is because the goal was love. The goal was love. The goal was repentance, and the goal was that those people would be saved. And as you remember the story of the prodigal, when he was separated from his father, and the father wasn't going and giving him money there, right? When he was separated from his father, that's when he realized. It says he came to himself. It's when he, he woke up and remembered, oh, I, I have a God who loves me. I have forgiveness. I have more than I can manage, imagine at home. Why would I choose the lies of the world over my God, right? And then he, he returns, and he returns. And we remember that the father did not respond with wrath. Like when that son came down the driveway, he didn't say, you better pay me what you owe me, right? He didn't say, you know, go sleep in the barn because we don't trust you and we don't love you anymore. No, he, he rejoices. He, he dresses him in a robe, puts sandals on his feet, and he loves him. He says, let's go, let's go feast, right? And so as soon as there was that repentance and that return to the Father, there was this flood of forgiveness and then salvation came. And that's to be us. That's to be us. Um, and just sort of a segue, but I think there's some of us that maybe feel 
separated from God and we feel sort of abandoned by, by him. And we're like, God, where are you? And it could be that you're in a pig pen. It could be that you, from your sin or your choices, had wandered, wandered away. And the Father is waiting. He is waiting for you to return. Right? Don't stay there and say, where is God? Don't try, to, don't try to forgive people from the pig pen. You need to be, to be forgiven first. Uh, from the text about the sexually immoral man that had repented, uh, Paul says, yes, he has grieved us all, uh, but now he says, it is sufficient. You'll notice that. It's sufficient. It's enough. We did what was right, and uh, he has repented, and he says, now forgive him. It says, comfort him, so he's not overwhelmed with sorrow. And then he says, but rather, love him. Love him. I like that. Because you don't want him to be consumed, right? You don't want him to be consumed by excessive sorrows. You don't want the man who's, who's sinned to spiral into darkness and to say, I can never be forgiven. I'm a cut off forever. There's no, there's no hope for me. Because that is Satan's trap, right? That is Satan's trap, that he could never be forgiven. And so Paul reiterates that. He reiterates that these are all, these are all schemes. There's a trap of unforgiveness, both for the one who had done the sinning, and there's a trap of unforgiveness uh, for the one who is trying to forgive uh, that person. And that trap would say now, if this church didn't forgive, the next trap would say, we can't forgive you. Or we forgive you, but you can't rejoin us. Right? To the sexually immoral or to the drunkard or whoever. He's gone. We finally got rid of him. Good riddance. Can you imagine such a buffoon was ever uh, coming to... I said buffoon, that's fun. Uh, coming to church in the first place. Uh, we finally got rid of him, right? So the trap was they were going to do this bizarre embrace of sin. The other trap is that they would stay in their unforgiveness. We are, we are, we are, you are cut off from us, you know, never, never to return. And both of those things, those things would be traps. Um, and as we know... Right? Forgiveness is hard. It is hard. Uh, and I think the, the challenge of it increases uh, with the magnitude of the sin, how bad it was, or how often uh, we are sinned against. Um, and this guy had done a bad one. He had a high magnitude with his, with his sexual sin. But Paul ended that and said, we are not unaware of the devil's schemes, and so you forgive. You forgive. It's never too bad. It's never too bad that you can't forgive. And I think sometimes we are, are trapped, you know, by Satan, by this unwillingness to forgive, that we have been sort of outwitted uh, in our own minds, and you're probably thinking of somebody because this is what happens when you talk on a subject, you're wrestling, uh, can I forgive this person? We're tricked into feeling like so-and-so, you know, shouldn't or can't or doesn't deserve uh, my forgiveness or whatever the, whatever the thing is. Uh, and Jesus tells us, he says, you can you actually can forgive, even if you don't feel like it. Uh, and for that, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 4, 4 to 6. Jesus is teaching his disciples on forgiveness, um, and then he says this. He says, if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. <laughs> it would obey you. I like that. We see first that forgiveness isn't, a, isn't a, an emotion thing. That forgiveness is actually a faith thing. It's a decision thing. It's a, it's a matter of the will. It's not about, it's not about the emotion at all. Right? Christ says, essentially, that you are not like the world. It doesn't matter what the world says. He says, you are my disciples, and I'm telling you, uh, to forgive. And immediately the apostles said, you're going to need to increase our faith because I don't have faith to forgive people that wrong me seven times a day. I don't have that kind of faith. And Jesus says, actually, you do. You do have enough faith. He says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, a little speck, I'm sure you heard lots of sermons about how big it is, you would have enough faith to say to that tree, be uprooted and cast into the sea. Uh, and in our denominations, we have many that like to talk about tossing mountains into sea uh, and uprooting trees and tossing them around uh, by faith. Uh, but what Jesus is talking about is, yes, you can toss the tree of unforgiveness into the sea. Yes, you can uproot that mountain and throw it into the sea. That is what he's, what he's talking about. He says, yes, you can. You can be free today. With that tiny little speck of faith, you can forgive, and you can see that tree with all its anger and its bitterness and the roots down in your heart. You can see that thing uprooted this morning 
he can see it cast into the sea. Jesus tells them they can. They can. Now we're going to look at another scripture. The fun thing about our new church, you guys might not know this friendship, is I don't have a clock anymore, so I have no idea how long I'm preaching for. Which is super fun, you know. For me, not as much for you. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, 12 through, 12 through 14. It's the Apostle Paul talking. He says, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ, I'm sorry, for which God had called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So good. So good. He's urging uh, those Christians to pursue Christ in greater ways. He says, I press on to take hold of that, to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. The idea is that Jesus had died to purchase me. He died to make me clean. He died to make me like himself. He died to redeem me and to sanctify me and to do all these things. And so now Paul says, I strain towards that. I pursue that thing that Christ bought me for. Right? And today we're pursuing forgiveness. That's the thing that we're straining towards. And he shows that, we're, that we in Christ are empowered uh, to do that. Paul says this odd thing. He says, I forget what lies behind as I strain towards this goal uh, of Christ's call heavenly. He says, I forget the past. I forget it. Um, and he doesn't. And so maybe that's helpful for you if you're trying to forgive. And the reason it's hard is because you can't forget the thing. Paul says, I forget. But we know that he doesn't because we can read. We've read chapter 1 and 2. And we know that Paul is talking uh, about different things. He's talking about how he was a murderer, how he used to kill Christians. He was talking about how he did all of these righteous things that he thought would gain him salvation. And really it was all garbage and filthy rags. He talked about how people beat him and put him in prison uh, and all of these other things. So when Paul says, I forget what lies behind, he isn't saying that you have to forget a sin in order to in order to forgive it because he's not actually forgetting he clearly remembers it what he's saying is is I've forgiven these things and now I can move on with my life is what he's saying I have forgiven myself of the heinous crimes of beating and killing Christians I have forgiven myself for thinking that I could earn God's salvation and because of what Christ has done in me and that forgiveness I have now forgiven others even though I'm now currently uh, in prison uh, and suffering for God so he can forgive them he can forgive them because of, because of that focus, because of the focus, because Paul knows what I think, I, or I hope that we know, is that there's only a few things in this world that really matters, you know, like Jesus, uh, obviously, because we're in church, and because that's just the truth, and Paul focuses on the prize, he's like, I'm focused on my prize, this is actually what matters, I want to win the prize. I want to be with my Jesus. I want to live forever. I want to have eternal life and treasures and glory with my God. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to pursue that. I'm going to focus on that. I'm not going to focus on what's behind. That stuff doesn't matter. I'm going to focus on pursuing my God and bringing him glory. And so he does. And that has to be our battle cry, right? That has to be what Christians are all about. Because we're straining and fighting and, and longing uh, to, to reach our Jesus and to bring other people into the kingdom. And if we have to strain with our with our, our forgiving and our loving and our compassion, and through the midst of it, that Jesus is calling us, calling us to do. Amen? I have two closing illustrations. I said the word closing uh, will not be soon, um, but there are only two. There are only two. Uh, one is dumb, and the other one is less dumb, okay? Uh, the second one is serious. The first one is silly, but it has a serious point. I'm just prepping you for that. Um, I stole both of them. I did not come up with either of them. Okay. Now we can commence with our illustrations. Uh, the first one is about caterpillars. Who likes caterpillars? Outstanding. Aren't they cute? With all them little feet. All those little pairs of shoes they have to put on their feet. Uh, and so they're pawing around in the leaves and in the dirt, and they're eating leaves. They have all those little feet. Sorry, I'm weird. Uh, in any event. Uh, so they're chomping on the leaves, and they're very cute, right? And then one day, they make a cocoon, or they buy one if they're not very handy at Menards, and they're expensive now, so they maybe steal their buddy's cocoon. In any event, they, they do that thing, uh, and then they emerge uh, as butterflies, and they can fly. What is that like, do you think, going from crawling around with 300 feet to flying around? 
It's got to be joyful. Yeah, it is what dying is going to be like. That's a good job. Look at you all mature. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so we're butterflies flying around. Uh, have you ever seen a butterfly fly back down? So now he's flying. He's super cool. He's, he's beautiful. And then he goes back down with all of his buddies. All the butterflies fly back down into the dirt, into the mud. And they start kind of walking around with all their little feet again and climbing up the little stems and doing all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about, right? I thought I just made it up. You guys are liars. You never saw that. They don't do that. Whoever said they know what I'm talking about, you can't believe those people. No, I'm kidding. I'm just teasing. Anyway, okay, the, the point is, is that they fly, and they don't go back to doing the same, the same futile, futile things, right? They're butterflies now. They fly. Why would they go back to playing, uh, playing in the mud? And I think sometimes that's us. All of these butterfly analogies can be us. Uh, that some of us, we never learn uh, to fly. We never, we never leave the cocoon. I don't know if that's a thing. Because we don't think it's possible. We don't think that we could actually be forgiven. We couldn't possibly in our wildest dreams believe that we could fly above this pain and this unforgiveness and these chains of bitterness. And so we never actually go in the cocoon and we never actually fly. And we spend our whole lives just walking around with our little feet in the mud, uh, getting eaten by everything that comes in sight. And the message of that is like, you're, you're supposed to be a butterfly. Like God made you to be a butterfly. Like, so just get in your cocoon, get with your Jesus, and then fly home when you're done. Sound good? That's some, high, that's some good illustrations right there. Uh, and I think some of us are like those butterflies that don't actually roll back in the mud that you guys lied about earlier and we forgive you for. Um, some of us do that because we have experienced the love of Christ. We have experienced forgiveness. Right? We're flying and we feel free and we have joy and there's peace and there's a new way of life and I have a new perspective on the world. But then when it comes to this matter of forgiveness, and usually it's just one Maybe two things, but usually it's just one thing, this one thing, and it draws us back, and it draws us back to the mud and back to the dirt, and we're crawling around, and it gets in our wings, and now we can't fly anymore, and now we're stuck crawling around the mud in unforgiveness and bitterness and agony and pain, like we, like we had never been free, like we had never been butterflies in the first place. And the message of this silly illustration is you've been reborn, like you, by the power of God, you can fly. You don't have to be in the mud. You don't have to be bogged down with, with this unforgiveness. Amen? Okay, so if Jesus and Paul and the butterfly didn't help you, I have one last illustration. Uh, and it's about an ordinary woman. Her name is Corey uh, Ten Boom. She's famous. Uh, anyway, but she was ordinary to begin with. Uh, and she was born in the Netherlands. And she was no one special. Uh, and then she got to go to prison and to a concentration camp in Ravensbrück. Uh, during the Second World War at the hands of the Nazis. And her crime was something heinous. She was a very bad sinner. Uh, she had hid uh, Jewish people trying to escape, I'm joking about it being heinous, uh, trying to escape from the SS guards and from the Nazis. She has chosen to hide these people, to help them, to show the love of Christ uh, to God's people. And for it, her family, herself and her father and her sister, uh, were thrown into prison. Um, and then she went to concentration camp where she dealt with all the horrors of that stuff, the starvation and the abuse. Um, she saw her dad and her sister die uh, in these places. And eventually Corey is, is released and she goes back to the Netherlands and she starts a home uh, to help people that are struggling uh, with what had happened to them in the concentration camp. And Corey said this, which I thought was super helpful. She said, those who are able to forgive their former enemies Okay, we're talking about Nazi guards, yes? Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical stars. Those who nurse their bitterness remain invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. That was it. That was the only connection between healing and progressing in life was this matter of forgiveness. Uh, in Germany post-war, was a very depressed place. It was, from what I read, I wasn't alive. I'm super young. Um, because of what had been done, there was horror over what had been done. And, and Corey seen that need for forgiveness. She left the Netherlands and went to Germany, this time not as a prisoner, this time willingly, and she went to preach Christ, to give to the Germans forgiveness, because it's found only in Jesus. And she went to give it to him. And so she does all these services across Germany. And this one is in Munich, 
Uh, and she's telling them how Jesus forgives them and how he casts their sins uh, into the ocean where they're seen uh, no more. And after the service, she sees a guy that she recognizes. I don't know if you've, know, if you've heard the story. But she sees a guy that she recognizes, and it happens to be one of the guards from the concentration camps, one of the SS guards, uh, who had personally beat her uh, and degraded her in the showers at Ravensbrück at that concentration camp. And after the talk, she says in her book that that guard uh, walked up to her, and he doesn't recognize Corey, and says, you mentioned that you had been in Ravensbrück uh, in, in your talk, and he said, I was a guard there. And Corey's like, yeah. Um, and then he said, but since that time, I've become a Christian, and I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, young lady. And he stuck out his hand, and he said, will you forgive me? Uh, in her book, Corey said that she was angry, that her thoughts boiled uh, within her, and she knew that it was wrong. She knew that Christ had died on the cross for this man. How could she ask for, for more than that? But can you imagine her struggle? I mean, I feel like weeping for this lady, even though this thing happened 70 years ago. But can you imagine? And he's just standing there with his hand out. And she had just preached the forgiveness of Christ that covers every sin to all of these people. It's why she was in Germany, to see people set free. And he just stood there with his hand out. And Corey said that she just stood there with, with a coldness clutching your heart. Pausing the story. Another saint, St. Wanda, last week told me after service that she felt like unforgiveness was like a cage that was around her heart and that for years and years and years and years, it was a cage that prevented her from feeling love. It was a cage that prevented her from loving. It was a cage that prevented her from forgiving, uh, from, from being forgiven, that cage of unforgiveness. And it wasn't until she forgave uh, that her heart was, was free. Uh, and that's what's happening to Corey in this moment, right? Because she had been freed physically from the cage of the concentration camp. She had been freed psychologically from the pain of, of watching her sister brutally, brutally murdered. Uh, she had been freed um, from all of those things by Christ who had forgiven her. And, and now in this moment with that guard, with this hand up, with this choice of should I forgive him or not, she's got her hand on the door of that cage. Because if she doesn't forgive him, it's undone. It's undone. Because she would have closed that cold, simmering anger that she said was rising up within her. She would have locked that into her heart, and she would have been back in prison. And Corey said in, in, in her book, in that moment, this is all happening in that moment, with his hand still out, looking her in the face. And she says, I was angry and cold, but she reminded herself that forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And it can function regardless of the temperature of her heart. She's saying, I don't have to feel it. I don't have to feel like I'm forgiving her. It's, it's an act of the will. Jesus said, do it. He says, you have the faith to do it. You can do it. And so she said in that moment that she prayed silently. She said, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. That's all I can do. I can lift my hand. You're going to have to supply the rest. You're going to have to do the rest. And so she says that she stuck out her hand. She stuck her hand out, it said woodenly and mechanically, she stuck it out. Um, and she said that he put, she, he took her hand and she said when their hands met that she felt this tingling warmth go down her arm and into their hands and she felt this healing joy fill her whole, fill her whole body. And she said once that happened, because God was in that place, she said once that happened, that she said she cried out, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you with all of my heart. God did that. People don't forgive Nazi torturers. God did that. She was forgiven, and she was able to forgive because God set her free. All she could muster was to stick her hand out. But she trusted God with her pain, and she trusted God with her past, and she trusted God with that guard. The salvation came, and I'm gonna, I urge you, I... I urge you, we got to get out of prison. we got to get out of this trap of unforgiveness. And it seems hard, but all he's asking you to do is to stick your hand out. You know that person. You know the thing. And maybe you can just whisper it when we go into worship. Just the words, I forgive you. 
I think most of us have a Nazi guard that we need to forgive. I think most of us have to do that. You don't need the emotions. That will come. Jesus says, stick your hand out uh, and forgive him. And just before we close, I just wanted to say, I think a lot of times that that person that we can't forgive is us. It's us. Have the same compassion. Christ forgave you. And you can say that out loud too. That was, that was my struggle for 10 years, I think. And finally one day I said, Adam, I forgive you. Maybe that person is you. And the last one, maybe you can't do either of those things. And what we discovered today and last week is if you can't do those things, then maybe you're still a prodigal. Maybe you're still a caterpillar. And that's why you can't reach out your hand, and that's why you can't say the words. And if that's you, I would just say to you that God, the Father, is here today. And he has reached out his hand. And he's ready to say the words, I forgive you. And so if you have never received the forgiveness of God, I just encourage you to do that. To do that. Because his hand is out. So we reach out our hands, we receive his forgiveness, and then we can reach out our hands, we can forgive anyone even Nazi guards. Amen? Amen.
going to close with a, with a prayer. I think it's significant. This will only take a second. Uh, it is uh, the anniversary of, of Pentecost. We remember how God poured his Holy Spirit on his people in that day uh, with signs and wonders and, and, and gifts and power. But the, same, the same Holy Spirit can empower us. The same Holy Spirit, the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in us. That's the power that can enable our forgiveness. That's a power that can set us free. That's the power that can make us butterflies uh, to fly above this, above this world. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that, you that you first loved us. That you first loved us. 
that you have given this faith and nurtured it and that you loved us and forgave us and gave us your Holy Spirit and empowered us, Father, that we could do what otherwise we could not. And so, Father, we ask for miracles, as miraculous as that day was, that it would be that miraculous today, that we would be that free, that empowered by your Holy Spirit to both feel forgiven but to also forgive others. So we just ask, God, that you would do that in our midst. Do that in our midst. That we would leave here rejoicing and changed and changing others by the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ. Amen.